good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen and all the students uh, and enthusiasts in uh, middle east or west asian politics uh, welcome all of you on behalf of uh, department of geopolitics and international relations and also the middle east institute uh, new delhi uh, today's webinar is is titled as uh, understanding the abraham accord in west asia probable options for india uh, we have uh, four prominent personalities uh, who would be discussing this particular aspect we are not uh, dwelling upon everything and anything on the region but very specific to abraham accord some house rules please all of you um, switch off your microphones except when you are uh, speaking that would help us in terms of uh, recording and many other things so that we avoid unnecessary noise and today uh, uh, we have uh, ambassador sanjay singh former secretary east minister of external affairs new delhi and uh, former indian ambassador to iran and uh, i welcome you on behalf of the department and uh, middle east institute new delhi sir uh, the second speaker would be dr samina hamid the assistant professor center for west asian studies jnu uh, she would be speaking on the economic aspects and i will be specifically telling about the uh, theme that she would be talking so welcome uh, you madam on behalf of the department as well as uh, mei uh, we have dr mudassir kumar uh, associate fellow uh, mp idsa new delhi uh, he is a well known face uh, he's been to lot of uh, webinars and other things on west asia so uh, welcome you also dr mudassir and then uh, the man who knows uh, or who doesn't require introduction as such uh, when we talk about anything that's associated with israel or the region itself that's professor p r kumar swami i think uh, uh, more than anything else it's he who's instrumental in uh, having this one it is his idea and it is he who uh, has been driving uh, most of the things that i am trying to do here with regard to this particular subject and uh, he is the professor uh, at the west asian studies and then he is also honorary director at the middle east institute new delhi so without wasting our time um, we will probably begin with the uh, first speaker that is ambassador sanjay singh and my request to all the speakers is we will have uh, if possible just 15 minutes of the speech or your observations and then uh, at the most as we can go up till uh, 20 not more than that one so that we have enough time for uh, uh, what you say the q and a because the purpose is to initiate lot of discussion now i would request uh, my uh, phd student uh, mr nadi mahmud to introduce ambassador sanjay singh to the audience uh, thank you sir am i audible Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. A uh, very good morning to all. It's a pleasure to have uh, Ambassador Singh with us, and it is a privilege for me to introduce Ambassador Singh. Uh, I'll try to make the introduction as concisely as possible because uh, it's an illustrious career uh, he has had. Uh, Ambassador Singh has served in the Indian Ministry of External Affairs for over three decades. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976 and retired in April 2013 during which he held numerous senior positions in the Indian missions in Mexico, Germany, Ghana, Vietnam and France. He also served as India's Consul General in Ho Chi Minh City from 19, 1997 to 2001 as Deputy Chief of Mission in Paris from 2001 to 2004 and as Joint Secretary and Additional Secretary for Gulf Region from 2005 to 2009. He also served as India's ambassador to Iran from March 2009 to March 2011 and took over as the secretary for Eastern Affairs in Ministry of External Affairs. He has been working with uh, institutions various institutions on issues related to foreign affairs and was president of the Association for of Indian Diplomats. He has been following developments in West Asia and India's relation with the region and participating in numerous events concerning the region. So without further ado I welcome you to this event organized by uh, the Geopolitics and International Relations Department at MAHI and uh, Middle East Institute uh, Middle East Institute New Delhi. Uh so over to you sir. Uh thank you very much Nadeem Dr Nand Kishor thank you and the Manipal Academy of Higher Education for inviting me to participate in this webinar on the Abraham Accords. 
Professor Kumar Swami, Dr. Samina Hamid, Dr. Mudassir Kumar, and distinguished participants. I will begin with giving details on the Accords, Indian official response, India's interest in West Asia, its relations with UAE and Israel, and end with a short prognosis. The Israel-United Arab Emirates Normalization Agreement, known as the Abraham Accords Peace Agreement, is the Treaty of Peace, Diplomatic Relations, and full normalization between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel. It was initially agreed to in a joint statement by the United States, Israel, and UAE on August 13, 2020. The UAE thus became the third Arab country after Egypt in 1979 and Jordan in 1994 to agree to formally normalize its relations with Israel, as well as the first Persian Gulf country to do so. Concurrently, Israel agreed to suspend plans for annexing part of the West Bank. The agreement normalized what had long been an informal and fairly robust relationship between the two countries. The agreement was signed at the White House on September 15th this year, this has now been followed by agreements on investment, aviation, cooperation in science and technology, and visa avoidance on 19th October. These add to the agreements between US, Israel, and UAE to contribute to the Abraham Fund of $3 billion to be used for development activities in the region. Bahrain followed the UAE in also signing a similar agreement with Israel. This was also formalized recently on the 19th of October. Last night, President Trump said Sudan is also to normalize relations with Israel. The Arab Peace Plan of 2002 had already accepted Israel's right to exist as a separate state. The first direct flight of the Emirates Airlines to Israel had taken place in May this year, and there were growing contacts between Israel and UAE. The logic of the threat from Iran had already brought Gulf Arab states closer to Israel, and the UAE was interacting substantively with it. However, this development also impacts in various ways the Israeli-Palestinian conundrum which becomes more intractable by the day. While the Palestinian Authority, Turkey, Iran, etc., have criticized the accord in the harshest terms, it has generally been welcomed around the world as a positive step. India welcomed the accord, underscoring that India supports promotion of peace and stability in West Asia. On August 15, 2020, the official spokesman of the Ex Ministry of External Affairs said, EM received a call this afternoon from the UAE foreign minister on the announcement yesterday of the full normalization of relations between UAE and Israel. India has consistently supported peace, stability, and development in West Asia, which is its extended neighborhood. In that context, we welcome the full normalization of ties between UAE and Israel. Both nations are key strategic partners of India. India continues its traditional supports for the Palestinian cause. We hope to see an early resumption of direct negotiations to find an acceptable two-state solution. After the accord was signed, on September 15, the official spokesman reiterated this, saying that we have followed the Abraham Accords signed in Washington, D.C. by UAE, Bahrain, Israel, and the U.S. As I have said earlier, India has always supported peace and stability in West Asia, which is our extended neighborhood. As such, we welcome these agreements for normalization of relations between Israel and UAE and Bahrain. We also continue our traditional support 
for the Palestinian cause and hope for an early resumption of direct negotiation for an acceptable two-state solution. UAE and Israel are strategic partners for India in West Asia, a region of crucial importance for India. The normalization of relations between them would make it easier to deal with both our strategic partners and even in concert if required in this region. West Asia as part of India's extended neighborhood, its stability and particularly that of the Gulf region is of strategic importance. Over 9 million Indians live and work in the region, sending back valuable remittances. The region provides over 70% of India's oil and gas requirements, as well as phosphatic fertilizers and urea essential for agriculture. The pandemic and the recent economic slowdown in the region has led to a large number of Indian nationals returning. But at the same time, the outgo in energy imports has also shrunk. This is a process that will hopefully reverse itself as the pandemic subsides. West Asia is India's largest economic partner with trade exceeding last year $150 billion and a growing investment partnership. A large number of Indians have faith based linked with holy sites in the region and visit them on pilgrimages. India has developed bilateral institutional mechanisms with nearly all countries in the region to enhance cooperation in the fight against terrorism and extremism. It has defense and security cooperation agreements with a number of countries on the region. India has moved from a look west to think west and now link west by building strong economic and security ties. It has steadily strengthened its multidimensional relationship with the region, and now these have acquired a critical mass ready to expand exponentially. To sum up, India's strategic interests are in the region are security interests, fighting extremism and terrorism, piracy and transnational crime, protecting the sea lanes of communications, guarding against nuclear and chemical weapon proliferation. Economic interests are trade, investment and energy, and the welfare of Indian expatriates in the region. India's response to developments in the region is predicated on these considerations. India's relations with UAE have strengthened considerably over the last few years. In January 2017, Abu Dhabi's crown prince was invited as the chief guest for the Republic Day. During this visit, India and UAE declared that their partnership had been elevated to a comprehensive strategic partnership. The crown prince had earlier visited India just a year back in February 2016. Prime Minister Modi himself had visited the Emirates thrice in August 2015, February 2018, in August 2019, when he was awarded the Order of Zayed, the highest such award of the UAE. In May, March 2019, late Simati Sushma Swaraj, the then External Affairs Minister, had attended the Organization of Islamic State meeting in Abu Dhabi, where India was invited as guest of honor country by the UAE and addressed the inaugural session of the 46th session of the OIC Council of Foreign Ministers. UAE hosts the largest number of Indians in the region, over 3.3 million, who remit around $17.5 billion every year to India. UAE was India's third largest partner globally in 2019, after China and the US, with bilateral trade amounting to nearly $59 billion. UAE is also an important source of oil, and an Indian company, OVL, had been a ma made a partner in an exploration block in the country. It is a large investment partner with investments between 10 to 11 billion in India, including investments in ports, real estate, and India's strategic oil reserves. 
There's a target set by the UAE to invest up to $75 billion in India, which will include investment in the giant Ratnagiri refinery. Indian investments in the UAE are also considerable. There is growing cooperation in defense and counterterrorism. The UAE itself is playing a more robust role in the region, being less affected by the global slowdown owing to its most diversified economy. It recently launched Amal, a satellite to Mars, and is operationalizing its Baraka nuclear power reactors, the first in the Gulf. This accord will facilitate it receiving more advanced armaments from the US, such as the F-35 aircraft. Israel is a strategic partner of India with strong cooperation in the fields of agriculture, defense, homeland security, and counterterrorism. Prime Minister Modi is the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel, which he did in July 2017. This was reciprocated by Prime Minister Nitin Yuhu in January 2018. Earlier, President Mukherjee and President Rivlin had exchanged visits in 2015 and 2016. Bilateral trade at $5.8 billion is substantive and includes vital inputs for Indian defense. There is growing cooperation in science and technology and space technology, IT and software development, and Israel has set up 29 centers of agriculture in India with focus on horticulture and dry land farming in which they are experts. There are over 85,000 Indian Jews who made Israel their home, as well as another 14,000 Indians in Israel. There's now a direct Air India flight to Israel and a robust exchange of tourists. Earlier on January 28th this year, President Trump with Prime Minister Netanyahu by his side had launched the Middle East peace plan, which he called the deal of the century. Palestine Authority President Mahmoud Riz Abbas had rejected it, describing it as a slap of the century. This launch followed seminal U.S. decisions, which include moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, considering Israeli settlements in the West Bank as not inconsistent with international law, Israel has leveraged Iran phobia well, getting considerable support from President Trump on the Palestinian issue and greater understanding from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and his crown prince. Further annexation is on hold now following the deal with the UAE, yet settlement activities are gathering speed, which have been deemed to be legitimate by the US. Nevertheless, Israel faces domestic political instability despite the third election in the year last in March due to the uneasy coalition between Netanyahu's Likud and Benny Gantz's blue and white coalition. The criticism of government's handling of the pandemic, Netanyahu's own difficulties with his indictment for corruption create a considerable uncertainties in Israel. Added to this is the chaos across the borders in Gaza, Lebanon, and in Syria, and the growing strength of the Hezbollah and increasing Iranian presence in the north. While the Palestinian peace process is somewhat dead, the problem will not go away. This has its effect on the Arab street and feeds a sense of grievance. Middle East, especially West Asia, is confronted with daunting political socio-economic and security challenges, and the region is undergoing major transformations. The so-called Arab Spring has considerably destabilized it. The region is afflicted by the continuing violence in Libya, Iraq, Yemen, and Syria, which no, show no signs of abating. A good development is the recent accord to announce a ceasefire in Libya. The Palestinian-Israeli conundrum, the deepening divide between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the region also faces challenges of coping with sectarian, extremist, and ethnic contentions. 
the region suffers from a proliferation of radical extremist groups. These tensions raise serious concerns. Priority should be on how to avoid another conflict, especially that involving Iran directly, which could be devastating for the region and deleterious for the global economy. This can only be addressed on the basis of broad-based understanding and not by military means. West Asia is undergoing fundamental change and the Abraham Accords are indicative of it. The Accords to an extent anticipate perhaps a less involved US, a rising Iran, the increasing role of Russia and China. There is a slow but sure geopolitical integration of Israel in West Asia. As Israel normalizes ties with Gulf, Gulf Arab and other regional nations, there are indications that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia views the accords positively and may emulate the example of the Emirates. If that happens, it will considerably reshape the regional situation. It would also make Israel more comfortable in its environment and give it greater confidence to address the Palestinian issue with greater dispatch. Post the Accords, both Israel and the Gulf states should have a greater sense of security and confidence in dealing with Iran, and this may enable them to engage with it more substantively and to address matters that cause them concern and discuss how mutual confidence could be built. This engagement could over time culminate in regional security arrangements that should include all regional and extra regional nations with a stake in West Asian security. While this, require, well, this will require a leap of faith, however, given statesmanship and support from major powers, it is not improbable. Given that peace and stability in the Gulf, in particular, is of strategic importance for India, India will need to be an active participant of this process and to encourage it. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think that was uh, uh, great to begin our uh, webinar itself. Um, now uh, we would have our uh, second speaker, uh, Dr. Samina Ahmed uh, Hamid, and uh, she would be speaking on the economic implications of the Abraham Accord in West Asia. But uh, before that, I would request my uh, PhD scholar, uh, Ms. Purnima Balasubramanian, to introduce Dr. Samina to the audience. Purnima, are you there? We're unable to uh, hear you. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, a very good, uh, good, e good morning to everybody. I take immense pleasure in meeting Dr. Samina Hamid. Dr. Samina Hamid is an assistant professor in Middle East Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Her areas of specialization include Middle Eastern economy. Yes, economic relations with the Middle East and energy security issues. And she has contributed photographs, journals, articles, and chapters to edited volumes. She was the Ocean Gulf 2020 in with the region. She has prepared, prepared research papers and study reports for the Ministry of External Affairs and other trade and commerce organizations at SOCHAM. She has been a member she of the select group on Gulf and West Asia. She was also a member of the Indian team for India GCC Strategic Partnership Project and the Indo Saudi Dialogue. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, MIAI, for having me here. Good morning to all the distinguished participants. Uh, Ambassador Sanjay Singh had given a very important groundwork details of our relations with both the country. What I will do is, is just flag a few economic fallouts of the accord. And uh, um, 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll take the help of your maps. But before we move on to that, I would just say a few things that we knew that this uh, the relations between UAE and Bahrain with Israel had been brewing for almost a decade. But with two strokes of a pen, we see certain giant strides in terms of economic deals in the region. And that has the potential to transform some of these existing trade, commerce and travel. So we'll, uh, we'll see some of these as we go down. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, where we can see the uh, we, can, we can see the map. P please press enter. Yeah, so uh, just after this Abraham Accord, as we uh, say it, a very crucial geography has stepped out of shadows. Uh, you can see this land bridge between Elat and uh, Ashkelon. It's a land bridge that connects Red Sea and Mediterranean. We, this was a very secretive arrangement made by Elad Ashkelon Pipeline Company, ironically in joint venture with pre-revolutionary Iran in the wake of the Swiss Canal. In contemporary times and just after the accord, this, has, this is gaining traction for a variety of reasons. One, and it and it has the potential potential to shave off significant business that flows through the Swiss Canal. Because Swiss Canal suffers from three major problems. One, the tanker size is limited. The Swiss Max is half the size of VLCC carriers, very large carriers which can move up to Port Elath here. And uh, the cost is very high, approximately $300,000, $400,000 per trip of the Swiss Max, there's increasing congestion. So what is happening, at least in times of very low oil prices, the oil tankers prefer going around the Cape of Good Hope, around Africa, to avoid this cost and congestion. So just after the accord, the company, uh, um, just after the accord, the company is making with the Gulf oil uh, producers in order to project themselves as an important gateway for communicating oil from Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And lo and behold, uh, next please, just press enter. We'll see. Press enter a couple of times. Is it hanging? Press enter, please. Oh, by the time it comes up, let me just use my arrow to illustrate what I'm saying. It also has the potential to take the wind out of the Iranian sail at Strait of Hormuz, because if the right connections are built here across this Arabian Peninsula, you can straight move into this region, into the Mediterranean Sea. So, um, and, and, and all the Gulf producers are very keen on using every possible opportunity to avoid the Strait of Hormuz. And we have an existing east-west oil pipeline across Saudi Arabia, which has the capacity of 5 million barrels per day and expanding it to 7 million barrels per day. Uh, next, please. So this is the uh, company map and it is these are the ex existing pipelines and the capacity it is 250 kilometers pipeline and uh, it has the capacity to flow 600,000 uh, 600, barrels per day with storage capacity around two terminals of 3.7 million cubic meter. And the most important aspect of this pipeline is the bi-directional flow. It was earlier purpose to bring oil from uh, the Caspian and Black Sea into the Asian market. Now what these company officials are doing is to project themselves the bi-directional flow as an alternative to bring Gulf oil into the Mediterranean as an alternative to Swiss oil, uh, Swiss canal, as well as the uh, the pipeline that exists from Egypt, Egypt towards the Mediterranean because it is only unidirectional. And uh, so the re-Christianed uh, company now called as Europe Asia Pipeline Company. Uh, next, please.
yeah so this that's a capacity that's a storage capacity and and so, uh, so as soon as this accord is been signed a lot of this thinking has been underway and an mou has been signed in uh, in abu dhabi between this company and the red met in, uh, red met in uh, abu dhabi in the presence of us uh, in the presence of us uae and israeli businessmen and officials to make use of this land bridge and to uh, to communicate oil from red sea to the mediterranean next please next please this press enter maybe it's got hand because we need to see the chart to just yeah and if we, oh it's gone yeah thanks so if um, so it uh, israel has also been trying to rope in uae for its uh, east mediterranean gas projects in fact in 2018 media was a wash with the reports that uae is actually made those investment but we didn't hear anything after that so the scene here is uh, this is this uh, east asia um, sorry east mediterranean gas forum which is unique in many ways it came uh, it came in, uh, it was a um, it came into being in 2008 early 2018 it is it is unique in two respect one it is the first organization where israel is has been officially admitted as a member along with arab partners there are seven signatories including palestinian authority so just after nearly a month after this deal the charter of this organization was signed and but there is a bit of a contradiction in uh, israel's gas policy here because israel has uh, an estimated reserve of 500 uh, tcf trillion cubic feet and uh, that's what the british petroleum says though they say that it goes up to 1000 but we'll see what uh, we'll stick to what's been uh, we were, was the proven reserves its own consumption is about 10 uh, uh, 10 uh, billion its own consumption is about 10 billion that means the reserve to production uh, ratio would be it will give a lifeline of 50 years so there is some kind there's not much gas where there are two gas line uh, the pipeline projects one that takes the gas straight uh, to europe sidelining the arab cooperation whereas the east uh, mediterranean cooperative gas forum was basically the was conceived as a project where uh, Israel could uh, get into some sort of a regional gas cooperation with the Arab neighbors. So um, depending upon where UAE puts its money, we'll see how these projects will advance. And uh, UAE already has a uh, UAE already has stakes in Egyptian gas uh, offshore oil uh, gas fields. And next, please, if you just press enter, we'll uh, see a couple of things. Yeah, so UAE is already here, and uh, uh, and it is in talks with the uh, the Israeli sh uh, Shipyard Limited for a joint uh, bidding for Haifa port here, and this this as this flow of gas into Egypt is crucial because although Egypt's Egypt's gas supply has increased in recent times, but its LNG terminals are still lying underutilized and will be you. The export, which has already begun early this year, is very crucial to that. So I believe that UAE investment, keeping Qatar in rear view mirror, trying to um, push Qatar out in its own backyard. Uh, so we are expecting some major deals here. Next, next, please. So then there, uh, there are deals with shipping deals. Uh, as I told you, they are jointly bidding in uh, Haifa. Uh, and, and DP World, which operates almost 10% of the global shipping, it is in talks with uh, it is in talks with uh, Do uh, Dover Tower, which also has a participating interest in Ilat. They want to have a dedicated shipping line between Jebel Ali and Haifa. And a couple of days ago, UAE cargo has already reached Haifa. And the official estimates are there some three. Uh, it, the trade could be of some. Four billion dollars. Now, Jabal Airy is the largest port in Middle East. It's multimodal connectivity, and that means from here, within the span of uh, you know three hours, you can touch by air. You can touch uh, a radius of a population of three to four billions, and a direct connectivity to 150 ports around the world. So, uh, and and both of them are transshipment hub. 
Uh, this kind of arrangement we don't have because we still are dependent on Dubai Colombo for transshipment uh, facilities. So this is a major deal that is going to reshape a lot of commerce, rerouting them from Swiss Canal to this land bridge into the Mediterranean. Next, please. Uh, in aviation, uh, just a quick look at the indicators. Uh, the GDP, Israel is not very far behind UAE. Bahrain is in a very bad situation because of its lesser reserve. Population-wise, both uh, both UAE and Bahrain are less than 10 million. And if we look at uh, the purchasing power, um, uh, GDP at, at purchasing power, the, the, there is a uh, there is a disparity. Although Israel is also reasonably high, but there is a lot of inequality that needs to be addressed. Which, uh, which and this partnership would be useful. And all the three countries face major problems of unemployment. And we can see these figures here, and especially in the COVID, Israeli unemployment has gone up to 17%. And the economy is contracted by 10%. So that's a major challenge they have to face. Next, please. And this is just a fleeting glimpse as the all these details investor uh, has already given. Next, please. Yeah, and, and aviation and tourism. Uh, beyond the numbers, I mean, uh, it is very apparent that a lot of time and money will be simply shaved off because of these uh, deals uh, in civil aviation. And in early September, Saudi Arabia also allowed all the flights moving uh, into UAE and, and moving away from UAE to all other parts of the world can use its airspace. And the first flight uh, literally was covered in three hours, 17 minutes. And this, this has a impl symbolic implication in terms of uh, that the, reg the regional buy-in of the agreement is there. Tacit blessing is there in, by neighbors who are not, who do, still do not have formal uh, and beyond the numbers, it's the cultural connect that's important. And uh, Abu Dhabi has already launched its Hebrew website, says welcome from Abu Dhabi in Hebrew. And Emirati has already launched uh, Crocher Arabia to provide uh, kosher food to the, uh, to the travelers. And this is very amazing because till now, with great difficulty, the Jews in UAE Manage, uh, uh, they did, probably did not get there the food that they want, the kosher food that they want, but with one stroke of a pen, this is all very possible now. Um, next, please. So with this exchange, we, uh, we are looking forward as great synergies, export, agricultural export from Israel, West Bank, Gaza, benefiting many Palestinians there will move into UAE, Jabal Ali Pro, from where it can disperse from uh, around the world. And UAE is, is like a gateway to the Arab region, like Hong Kong is the gateway to China. So with UAE in its, uh, in, its, uh, in its kitty, it can very easily reach to the, um, its products can reach in the Arab world. Approximately 66% of the GCC imports pass through UAE. Israel is a hub of uh, R&D. It's a startup nation, while UAE has a, just the right ecosystem for the startups and really looking forward for many technical collaboration. While Israel population is a little aging, the median age is 30. UAE has a much younger population. It is a great synergy between uh, digital. Uh, so Israel, which has the cutting edge technology in digital, uh, digital space, cutting across agriculture, health, finance, security, UAE's millennial generation, highest in transparency, uh, penetration, all of these are, you know, set to benefit from this. And what is most noteworthy is the Arabs in Israel and the Jews in UAE are suddenly becoming very important in order to facilitate these exchange. Next, please. Yeah, so just a quick look at the winners and losers. As we said, Swiss Canal, the company, uh, European Asian Pipeline Company, looks to divert 12 to 70 percent of the business coming uh, going through Swiss Canal. There we see some greater competition between UAE within UAE between Dubai and Abu Dhabi to attract the larger traffic of uh, tourists. Then there is uh, there'll be a competition between Israeli airlines and UAE carriers also. 
uh, uh, LR is already running for its money so much so that it actually sued uh, the government by uh, for allowing Air India to pass over Saudi Arabia while it could not do by itself. That sue petition was withdrawn later. Then the funds uh, is all uh, Bajaj Sandeep Singh has already talked about. Importantly, this fund will be used in the uh, in projects called Silicon Project in East Jerusalem, and this is going to generate ten thousands of jobs to the Palestinians who are there. It is going to connect the high-tech uh, Palestinians to the UAE company. So uh, there's going to be some positive spillovers. I think I'll wrap up it there, and then in Q and A, I'll address other issues as it comes. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was an excellent presentation, uh, so precise, and then with uh, all those numbers, I think um, very important. In fact, that's the outcome. Otherwise, just to um, restore normalcy, that does not mean only. Um, the security component it also includes a lot of other things which is which is going to be changing the face of the region itself uh, now we are done with the first two presentations so we'll have the question answer session now the floor is open uh, those of you who want to ask the question please raise your hand you have an icon that you can use uh, at the same time if you want to put it in the chat box you can also use the chat box and those of you who want to ask question please uh, initiate the question answer now yes miss purnima oh yes sir um my uh, question is to ambassador singh so first of all thank you for your presentation uh so a while ago, Israel's ambassador to India, Ron Malka, said that a trilateral between India, UAE, and Israel could be possible. So uh, I wanted to know what would be the prospects of such a trilateral and what are the possible area of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Punima, for uh, that question. Uh, Samina has given some indications of what are the synergies between UAE and Israel. And one of the areas that she has indicated is software and IT. This is another area that uh, we are strong on in India. And it's something that uh, gives possibilities for trilateral cooperation. So there you have a number of areas, not just IT, but agriculture for that matter. For example, we are the largest suppliers of agricultural produce to the Emirates market. Israel has technologies and other know-how of dry land farming. We also cooperate with the Emirates in promoting dry land farming. Can the three countries get together and discuss these issues? So there are immense possibilities. Previously, these were not possible because Israel and UAE did not have any relationship. So India has the manufacturing base. Israel has technology. India also has technology. And UAE has capital and a market and marketing ability. So there can be synergy in various ways in the economic field. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, do we have uh, other questions? Yes, Nadim. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, my question is to Dr. Sabina Hamid. Uh, first of all, very uh, interesting presentation. I wanted to ask about something related to the deal of the century in specific. Uh, the Wadi Lardun plan, the plan to annex uh, Jordan Valley, that is. I mean, as you know, the the economic incentive with respect to Jordan Valley is immense and the proportion with respect to other annexations and Jordan Valley 
would be very different. So how do you see that and how, how much of uh, how much of a mutual benefit can you uh, observe with regard to the annexation of Wadi al uh, And how, how would it be beneficial for Palestinians if, if, if it is in that case? Thank you. Uh, if I have understood your question, is it is it framed like this? How is annexation beneficial to the Palestinians? Is how, it how, 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 I mean, uh, during the negotiations as well, uh, the whole agenda in, on table was that it would bring prosperity to the Palestinians as well. So my question is, how much how much do you see it as a mutually benefiting plan? See, if you talk about investments that was talked about in the in the deal and also that uh, as a fallout of the accord, See, investments always bring empowerment. Till now, the Palestinians are under siege and are living on donations. Whatever happens politically, whatever happens to the cause of a Palestinian state is another story. But if people are empowered through investments, jobs, they are definitely in a better position to fight for their cause. We have seen the the risk, the failures of the past approach. If one can take the risk of hostility, why can't we not take the risk of peace? And as far as investments at the Silicon Wadi that I talked about, let me just uh, give a little, shed a little greater detail in this aspect. The Arabs population is 20% of the workforce but they represent only 4% of the high-tech workforce. At the same time, Israeli workforce, the high-tech component is 9%. And they are now facing the friction because about 150 MNCs are there. They simply fish on the best talent, give the best uh, pay package, and the local Israeli companies are are uh, you know re really running short of the local talents so when more investments are coming in more ventures are going to set up more jobs are definitely going to come in so it it's a very you know common logic that investments will bring prosperity empowerment and then it will enable you to fight for your cause you can't fight on donations and aid i hope i have uh, sort of conveyed with yes, yes. Yes, what? yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Akil. Akil, go ahead. Akil Kumar. Akil Kumar, you have a raised hand. If I have a question, please post to or address it to the concerned speaker. Doesn't seems like he has not unmuted himself. It looks like. In that case, in between, uh, I'll also uh, uh, like to ask Ambassador Sanjay Singh, sir, uh, what are the probabilities of uh, India trying to get the best out of this? Because of its its complicated uh, approach towards the region itself. Um, at times it would call it ethical, at times it would call something else. And now it has no uh, such reasons to other than those non-Arab states. It has no reasons to uh, make an issue out there or say or give reasons to it. So in which way uh, the, the India itself uh, would be in a position to make the best use of uh, the available opportunity and enhance its own uh, appearance and presence in the region. Uh, India, uh, uh, India already has a very extensive presence in the region. It has a multi-vectored foreign policy and multi-vectored relationship with each and every country in the West Asian region. I think they stand on their own. And these are helped by the region promoting it peace 
for any moves that promote peace and stability in the region, which is in Indian strategic interest. And that allows greater exchanges, interchanges, and helps in the cause that India thinks is necessary for promoting its own interests. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Akhil, um, I think you need to unmute yourself. He seems to be raising his uh, hand again, but um, is not able to ask the question. If there are any others uh, who want to ask question. Okay, we can as well take uh, even when the next session happens. In that case, uh, probably uh, we will move on to the um, next um, uh, session. That is, we have uh, two speakers in that one. We have uh, Dr. Mudassar and also Professor Kumaraswamy. Um, Dr. Mudassar will be speaking on Abraham Accord in uh, West Asia, the Palestinian perspective. So I would uh, request uh, Mr. Nadi Mahmud to introduce. Uh, Dr. Mudassar to the audience. Uh, sure, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, people who are working in the domain must be already familiar with Dr. Mudassar Palmer's name. I have personally uh, also have been in touch with him for uh, various uh, comments and inputs. How I'll try to make a, a, a brief introduction. There are a list of books and anthologies that he has written. It's very long, so I will try to make it as concise as possible. Dr. Mudassar Kwamur is an associate fellow in Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. He holds a PhD in Middle East Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has a broader interest in Gulf societies, political Islam, Middle East geopolitics, and India's relations with the uh, West Asian region. He has co-authored uh, several books. He has also uh, co-edited anthologies. Uh, his uh, research papers have appeared in leading international journal, journals and uh, Dr. Kaumar also uh, serves as the associate editor of Contemporary Review of the Middle East. And his recent work uh, includes uh, a monograph uh, on Turkey titled Earth Against Turkey, Politics, Populism and Democratization Dilemma. As I mentioned earlier, there are a, a list of books and anthologies that he has edited and worked on. I think uh, that would take up a lot of time. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Mudassar Kormer on behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, MAHI, and uh, the Middle East Institute, which is collaborating for this event. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nadeem. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be joining this uh, national webinar today. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Nanda Kishore for having me here and the, uh, you know, the, the Department of Geopolitics at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, you know, after this, the two, ex two extraordinary presentations, uh, you know, as I was saying, uh, about Linked to that geopolitics, and I think uh, Dr. Samina Hamid uh, gave a very good idea about the geoeconomic aspect of it, which is not uh, you know, talked about much. Uh, now, I have been asked, you know, to give a give an idea on the Palestinian perspective, uh, and I thought it is also an important you know issue especially uh, because we have seen this conflict, this convoluted and complex conflict lingering on for the last, you know, over 50, 50 years, obviously. Uh, and there has been no, uh, in, the, in the last couple of decades, there has been no signs of, you know, any, any progress towards uh, peace between Israel and Palestine. 
and all the despite all kind of international efforts uh, there has been very very little progress in fact the uh, peace process has been completely halted uh, and palestinian uh, representatives as well as the israeli side both have completely more or less refused to get back to the negotiation stable now since president trump uh, you know took office he has been trying to you know uh, kind of make some progress towards the middle east to to restart or re uh, revive the middle east peace process uh, and we all know he has been talking about the deal of the century and there has been several other uh, you know issues that have been raised uh, president son in law uh, and senior advisor in the white house jared kushner has been uh, making rounds of the entire region especially the gulf region to try and revive the peace process uh, but nothing seemed to be working and in august this after this you know peace accord was announced uh, it was uh, it was touted as especially by the white house as one of the as a breakthrough uh, as a breakthrough not only in the israeli arab conflict but also in the israeli palestinian conflict uh, one of the points which i think emanates from here is that whether it is a peace accord now if you look at the there are two aspects to it one is the israeli arab you know uh, larger israeli arab uh, problem or the conflict and the israeli palestinian conflict as far as the israeli palestinian issue is concerned i think the issue remains intact even though its uh, it, its context has certainly you know uh, changed in because of this uh, accord signing of this accord now when it comes to the israeli arab you know problem i think it is a very significant development as far as the uh, the the problem that has continued since the 19 you know since 1948 uh, uh, and in that sense one can give credit to the trump administration despite all the vagaries in you know uh, associated with president trump himself uh, you know one can give credit to the fact that he has been able to uh, kind of create a situation where uh, uh, or at least uh, uh, grab an opportunity which has been created due to due to the geopolitical developments in the region to push israel and uae to move towards normalization so in that sense it is more of a normalization between israel and gulf countries uh, than actually a peace uh, you know larger peace accord in that sense and if one comes to the israel arab you know normalization israel gulf normalization this is something very important and people who have been following the developments as far as the israel and gulf rapprochement is concerned they would understand that the process had started much earlier even during barack obama administration towards the uh, the second uh, uh, you know the the first term of president obama there were some efforts but it it did not materialize but given the uh, changing geopolitical situation after uh, spring things started to move 2015 onwards uh, especially because of the uh, is uh, the opening of israeli uh, representative office in the uae for the international renewable energy agency uh, in 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 dubai uh, in abu dhabi sorry uh, so in that sense i think it is a very uh, significant development now i'll come to the uh, palestinian aspect of it and i think there are five or six issues which i'll highlight and maybe uh, from there on we can you know take in terms of any questions and take the discussion forward one of the most important thing which needs to be understood from the palestinian perspective is that it is it it completely sidelines the israeli palestinian conflict the conflict per se in the larger regional political discourse uh it's not as if you know the, the israeli palestinian conflict had not already lost some of its you know preeminence as far as the regional politics is concerned post arab spring and even before that also uh things have started to kind of uh, the israeli palestinian conflict has started to become a little sidelined more so in the in the 
uh, in the context of Arab Spring and the uh, national interest, the way Gulf countries looked at their own national interest and their own security interest, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict had become completely, uh, you know, gone in the background, gone onto the background. And I think with this signing of the uh, accord and the kind of fast movement we have seen uh, onwards in the last month or so uh, between UAE and Israel, I think uh, it completely uh, puts the issue of the, uh, the conflict, the Palestinian conflict issue uh, completely on the background. So this is not a, no longer a preeminent issue in the in the issues that kind of you know uh, uh, is that can be listed as far as the regional issues are concerned that is the first point the second point is the palestinian rejection now if you look at the uh, statements and reaction and as ambassador singh was also uh, you know mentioning that palestinian leadership has completely rejected the uh, deal the normalization they have termed it as backstabbing. They have termed it as uh, treason. They have termed it as, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, sometimes even uh, one can actually, if, if one looks at the from the Gulf perspective, it, these are very derogatory terms which has been used by the uh, is Palestinian leaders, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the uh, Palestinian Authority president, Saeed Berakat, uh, who is the chief negotiator, the le uh, leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniye, and the Palestinian leadership has received support from Iran and Turkey largely in the in the region and to some extent also Qatar and obviously uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, but I think one one also needs to understand that this is a pattern which has been going on the Palestinian side, except in the 1993 uh, when there was a breakthrough. Uh, the Palestinian leadership has been has failed actually in grabbing opportunities that has been created, whatever little opportunity that has been created due to the geopolitics or you know due, uh, you know due to external actors or due to support by the Arab leaders. So in that sense, one can actually see that the same pattern continues, uh, and the Palestinian leadership has more or less failed to see the writing on the wall that you need to come on the negotiation table if you really want to kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 make the most of any opportunity that comes to the fore. The, and one of the reasons, and that is my, this, this is the second point, and the third point is that the Palestinian leadership has also, it, they have, they understand that they have lost a very important bargaining chip vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and that is normalization of relations with Arab countries, with, with UAE, Bahrain, and yesterday Sudan. It is likely that there would be other countries as well that will make some move, if not formally, then informally. And we know that when it comes to Saudi Arabia, which is the most influential country in the, re uh, in the region and the Islamic world, uh, because of obvious reasons, has been informally you know, engaging with Israel over the last decade, or at least over the last half a decade. And in that sense, the, Israel, the, the, the bargaining chip with the Palestinian ha have used in the past, I think that they have lost it in that sense. The, and, and, and I highlighted the point about how the, uh, the 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 Gulf countries' priorities have changed over a period of time. For them, their own security and the prosperity of the people, their people, is more important. And in that sense, Iran is something which which kind of occupies a prominent space in the psychology of Arab, you know, Arab foreign policy psyche, Arab you know security psyche. And this is also true with respect to Israel. And in that sense. That is something important that uh, that needs to be highlighted. That the security, uh, it, it's more of a two countries with common security interest coming together and you know making some sort of a correlation. So in that sense, that is also an important aspect 
which needs to be understood. Now, the, before coming to the concluding point, I'll just make one more point, and that relates to the sense of, you know, uh, uh, the 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 changing the frustration uh, among the Gulf countries because of the Palestinian behavior, and that is something which is which is very important to understand that over the years, uh, you know, the Arab countries, the Gulf countries, who did not actually had a direct conflict with Israel. They continued supporting the Palestinian side, sometimes even at the cost of their own interest. And increasingly, one sees that there. I mean, if you look at the some of the uh, uh, you know writings in the Arab Arabic newspapers, in the uh, you know English newspaper in Saudi Arabia and UAE, one can find that there have been several you know writings which actually uh, uh, kind of call for normalization of relations with Israel. So that is something which is, and, and if you look at as uh, last week, Prince Bandar, who is a prominent member of the Saudi royal family, he kind of publicly, uh, you know, during an interview, uh, expressed the frustration. And he said that initially I felt anger because of the Palestinian reaction, but when I looked at the details and the kind of things which they have been saying, I felt hurt. And I think that also uh, kind of expresses the sentiments of the uh, Gulf countries. Now, just to conclude, the Palestinian side finds themselves in a very difficult situation right now. And I think they have also not only lost a very important strategic, you know, kind of ally that were speaking on their behalf. I would also you know and and this is not something which 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 i i would say with a lot of pleasure i'm, I'm saying it with a lot lot of uh, you know uh, one one can understand the pain of the palestinian people but the palestinian leadership if they do not understand that they need to you know grab the opportunities created by geopolitics and because of the external power they'll continue to lose They'll continue to be on the failing side, as you know, the Prince Banda was saying. And this is not something which which can you know easily kind of go away. And 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 we have seen that, uh, for example, there has been some effort at reconciliation, and that has been going on. Egypt Egypt has been trying to reconcile between Hamas and Fatah and other you know factions within the Palestinian uh, organize Palestinian leadership, Palestinian organizations. But that has not certainly, uh, that has actually not resulted. I mean, every time they agree on a reconciliation, one week later, things go back to the square one. So I think, from if I look at from the Palestinian point of view, I take this as a as a sign that if we do not put our act together, if we do not work in terms of you know, uh, taking opportunities as they come, it will, uh, you know, it will. They will continue to squander their chances. And I think I'll stop here. I've exhausted my 15 minutes, and I'll be very happy to, you know, uh, you know, answer any questions that comes from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mudassir, and I think it was an excellent propositions that you brought in. Uh, now I would like to, uh, like to um, have Professor Kumar Swami on board. He would be speaking on Abraham Accord in West Asia, the Israeli perspective. And I would request uh, my PhD student, uh, Ms. Purnima, to introduce Professor Kumar Swami to the audience. Thank you, sir. Uh, as we know, Professor Kumar Swami do not, does not really need an introduction, but it's my pleasure to extend this formality. Uh, Professor P.R. Kumar Swami, the professor at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He was a research fellow at the Harry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, between 1991 to 1999. 
Ever since joining JNU in September 1999, he has been researching, teaching, and writing on various aspects of contemporary Middle East. His works include India's Israel policy, A to Z of Arab Israeli conflict, and Squaring the Circle, Mahatma Gandhi, and the Jewish National Home. He is also the editor of Contemporary Review of the Middle East and the Journal of Indo Judaic Studies from 2018. A warm welcome to you, sir. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Purnima, and um, thank you for your kind words. And uh, thanks to uh, Professor Nanda Kumar and uh, Ambassador Sanjay Singh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Samina, my old associate, uh, Manish, in the Manipal Institute, and uh, Professor uh, Arvind Kumar and uh, other friends and colleagues. One of the problems of speaking in the end is that everybody has spoken whatever I wanted to say. So at one level, it is a good news because you don't have to say anything new. But at the same time, since you by you cannot simply repeat everything people said, you have to say something different. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to put about four simple points from what we have been hearing for the last one and a half hours. And that will give you an idea about the implications of this account for Israel. First and foremost, it tells you the larger foreign policy agenda of Israel. If you are familiar with, from 1948 till today, ending the political and economic isolation has been the core foreign policy agenda of Israel. You know, if you look at any other country in the world, if you are a newly born country, you want everybody to recognize you. But the third or a fourth year, most important countries would have recognized, you would have closed the fight. But if you look at Israel, even 70 years later, you still have a sizable number of countries which have not recognized Israel's right to exist. So if you look at the Emirati, Bahraini or Sudan, the fundamental issue is these countries recognize Israel's right to exist. And the second thing is in achieving this, Israel was able to exploit the opportunities. These countries are afraid of Iran. Some of them are even afraid of Turkey. And the, the design of these countries, Israel is able to exploit it to its advantage. And suddenly, Emirate recognizes, I don't have a problem with the Jewish state. And if you look at it, this was the case from 1971, ever since the Emirate was established. There's nothing new. The same story with Sudan. Sudan is an existed from 1950. So Israel and Sudan never had a problem. Israel and Bahrain never had a problem. But why these countries took such a lot of time? That is where your department, the geopolitics comes into play. And what you notice is suddenly Emirate and Bahrain are concerned more about Iran, less about Israel. And that is what it is. The changing regional dynamics, Israel began to exploit it. Because if you look at Samina, I mentioned about the Mediterranean gas pipeline. If you look at the what is interesting thing, there are about seven countries in the region. And you know, if there is a forum have all these countries, including Italy. One country which is missing is Turkey. Because all these countries have some sort of a problem with Turkey. And Israel said, let's even Palestinians are there. The Palestinian Authority is there. And uh, Israel is there. Cyprus is there. Greece is there. Egypt is there. But not Turkey. So if you look at it, the foreign policy, you, you know, in the sense you can never have an ideal foreign policy. Foreign policy basically means given the ground reality, how do you maximize your interest? And this is where Trump comes into picture. You and I may have a different opinion about Trump, 
probably if Trump stand in front of a mirror, he may also come with a different opinion. But the issue is Trump has come, uh, emerged as the most pro-Israeli president Israel had ever seen. In a number of sense, he is more pro-Israeli than Netanyahu himself. Whether it's a question of Jerusalem, whether it's a question of Golan Heights, whether it's a question of annexation or settlements, his positions are right of Netanyahu. And therefore, Israel is able to exploit. And what did Israel promise to emirate to satisfy the Palestinians? It says we are deferring the annexation. And if you are familiar with Israeli politics, annexation was not the first priority of Netanyahu. Netanyahu talked about annexation only when he did not get a simple majority in the election. So in the third election, he simply said, let's have an annexation. The second point is a large number of people are suggesting, scholars, the normalization indicates the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This is a narrative. I'm not so sure about it, but this is what people are presenting it. What they are saying is to, to take on from what Mudassar has said, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict is now reduced to Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That is, it is a conflict between two neighbors. To put it very crudely, it's like Indo-Pakistan conflict. You sort it out. It's not my issue. I think that is the kind of thing we have got. As Mudassar was saying, we did not reach here overnight. If we got there over a period of time, we did not recognize that. I would submit with all my humility that the first country to recognize this, that is, you can no longer play the Palestinian card in your relations with the Arab world was India. India was the first country to recognize you can no longer promote your interests in the Middle East by playing up the Palestinian card. That is, Palestinian cause is no longer a currency of influence. That was in 92. And today, Emirates says the same thing. I support the Palestinians, but I'm not going to make the Palestinian cause as a precondition for normalizing relations with Israel. That is what it is. And if Sudan joins, the same story. And Sudan has a personal anger. IL-76, probably Falcon. So if you look at it, in, in uh, 1967, this the Khartoum summit came out with a resolution, three no's. No recognition, no negotiation, no peace with Israel. And yesterday, what is Sudan says? And that's what Netanyahu said. What is Sudan? Sudan says, yes, yes, yes. Instead of three no, now we are throwing three yes. It's a full circle. So the Israelis see it as an end of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is not factually correct. But what will happen is, it will considerably reduce the Palestinian leverage in the negotiations. Israelis can live with it. They can live with the problem. That is what you're probably getting to the idea. I'm not so sure. Probably you can live with the problem maybe another 11 days. If uh, Biden comes, you have a different dynamics. So we will come to that. The third thing is, if you look at the international write-ups, on the 15th of September and the 16th of September, dozens of articles have come. The significance of this, when did you begin, what are the implications, all of them. All the think tanks in the world and every scholars in India, every media people have written about it. Suddenly, everyone is an Israeli expert. That's a good news, actually, more the merrier. But when you look at the Israeli press, it didn't figure prominently. The most prominent agenda for them was COVID. 
And if you look at it, when Netanyahu signed the agreement in Washington, some of them actually said, stay there, don't come. That was the position. If you look at it, in the domestic Israeli politics, the impact of normalization is not very considerable. People are not talking about that. So that we need to look at it. And the final point is that historical. Is it historical? In a way, yes. In a way, no. If you look at the Egyptian and the Jordanian peace with Israel, they were very prolonged. They demanded certain concessions from Israel in terms of territorial uh, giving up. Sinai Peninsula in case of Egypt, and similarly certain more, uh, partial concessions along the Jordan Valley. But if you look at in the Emirati and the Gulf normalization, Israel did not do any price. It did not pay any price. It was relatively simpler. Therefore, to say it historical would be a little problematic. But it is also historical in the sense the floodgates will open now. So talking to Israel, dealing with Israel, visiting Israel, issuing a visa to Israel is a very normal thing. It's no longer a special. Therefore, what is, you know, the domestic population which is not excited by normalization in, normalization in Israel will be attracted by what Samin Ahmad said about the economic component. And what you're going to see is unbelievable. There is going to be trade, investment, partnership, scientific collaborations, innovations, and uh, you can even talk about um, high tech. And we are familiar with that. Israel and the Emirates are almost on the same plane when it comes to efficiency. And uh, my personal thing will be India will be a big loser in the normalization process. For the simple reason, efficiency is not part of our DNA. This is part of an Israeli DNA. This is part of the Emirati DNA. And therefore, if you look at it in terms of investment, innovation, scientific, academic, technological collaboration, Emirate and Israel is going to be the leaders. And we will actually simply stand and clap. One final word. Since, you know, when uh, before the session began, I saw uh, Vivekananda's picture behind uh, our friend Nanda Kishore's uh, table. You know, Vivekananda says, success is a bad teacher. It is an insult, humiliation, and uh, in and uh, uh, so defeat, they teach us a better in life. So if you are a Palestinian, the normalization is the worst thing you could have got. And therefore, this gives you an opportunity to ask a question, where did I go wrong? Because only then you will, because this would be a, what I would call an enlightened moment, moment. If a normalization did not teach you, Nothing will teach you, you don't deserve a state. Because if you look at it, you are at the Nadir, a country which you thought is a great friend, now one after the other is abandoning you. Rather than abusing everybody, you simply sit down and ask, where did I go wrong? So in that sense, I would say that the normalization, I'm telling in the negative sense, is the greatest thing happened to the Palestinian for a honest reflection. I think I'll stop at this point of time. Let's open the question answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think um, your uh, remarks certainly must have uh, led a lot of them to think in different ways and a lot of questions to be. And I see immediately there are a series of people who have begun with. I think the very purpose of doing it, I see five of them already. Uh, unlike the <laughs> other stations on OIC, a uh, series of them. So I'll go with the order that they raise the hand. Uh, I would ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Anand, to begin. Thank you, Kumar Swami, sir, for that uh, brilliant uh, exposition about uh, this whole uh, Abrahamic cards thing. 
but uh, i would like to ask you uh, uh, about this larger regional issue uh, if you look at those four legs of the table in uh, west asia we can see that now the israeli and the arab legs are coming closer together uh, what happens to the other two legs that is the persian and the turkic uh, turkish legs what happened to what will happen to those two powers uh, with respect to among themselves the israel the iran turkey equation how will this impact and uh, secondly sir uh, i would like to ask you about this uh, very recent proposition which uh, china has mooted about creating a new kind of a forum in the region even though the details about it is uh, sketchy but then how will you see china's initiative work out in uh, in after in the post abraham record setting thank you sir. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you as my colleague soon, and that's the first thing I would like to welcome you. And um, the question is, uh, Turkey and Iran—they are already uh, expressed their reservations over the agreement, and uh, they are. Uh, and I you know they already have reservations over this agreement. But the interesting thing is, while Iran is hostile towards Israel for last 40 years turkey has an embassy in tel aviv and today the palestinians are very happy that the turkey is supporting them when the dust settles down they will actually recognize the turkey is criticizing emirates for something Tur turkey was doing for the last 30 years if you're talking about the emirate is going to fly to israel turkish air is flying to israel almost 16 uh, no it was six flights a day so therefore there is going to be you know the palestinians would be excited today looking at how many people are going to support but eventually it won't work but the other thing is i think i would make a distinction between turkey and erdogan and i think israel will also will do the same thing israel thinks turkey is important for a geography and population and strength and economy but you have to put it out till uh, erdogan is in office it's something the same thing a lot of countries did to the united states us is important but trump you have to put up with him so that's the kind of thing they would do on the question of china china has one great advantage which is the economic resources it can actually uh, play the economic card but the flip side is china doesn't want to take a political lead and the moment you take a political lead you will have to choose between the countries because chinese interests are there in the arab countries as well as in iran so if you want to play a forum it's a very nice thing can you bring all these warring sides on the same table such an effort may be possible in washington but not my china china washington can perhaps if there is a change of mood in washington they can bring the uh, iranians and the saudis on a table china's ability to do china doesn't have the political capital so they won't be able to do it what they will do is it's a general statement everybody should talk and it's the same thing china talks about international order international law but when it comes to south china sea that doesn't apply so therefore we need to be it's a public relation exercise nothing substantial will come but probably russia has a better credentials than china thanks sir thanks yeah uh, dr monish oh god oh god <laughs> i thought oh, it's, you a... No? <laughs> it's a special pleasure sir um you know it's been more than 14 years i sat in your class and it's it is a pleasure to listen to you after so long um and uh, i think um, my question uh, uh, can be answered both by sir and uh, dr kumar uh, uh, and uh, of, of course it it has to do with the us uh, you know as a student of american politics and as someone who uh, teaches students here one of the things uh, i think that i struggle with answering students although i try my best is to really i think let them understand the nuances of uh, you know us policy towards the region and particularly to israel because when a moment you mention us israel you come up with certain let's say generalistic assessments that you know jewish lobby this and that 
and Israel is always the ally of the U.S. Um, I still remember Kumar Swami sir uh, in enlightening us in his class on the early efforts of people like Chaim Weizmann and others, you know, uh, putting up their tent in Washington uh, during the formation times. And the way I see it, um, I, I think uh, there is more to U.S. Uh, policy towards Israel than meets the eye in terms of this generalistic assessments uh, and also in terms of, uh, you know, the changes in the continuities whenever you have change of guards, both in the Congress and in the White House. You know? um, and what are the similarities across the board? Like, is Israel really a bipartisan issue in the Congress and in the White House? Uh, is there any possibility of polarization happening over Israel? in the United States. And last but not the least, uh, something that relates to the kind of news articles that Sir mentioned about in the wake of the Abraham Accord, which is, uh, you know, you are continuing to see this slew of like US broker this, US broker that. And this is something that very in is interesting that if you look at US brokering of peace or whatever you call it in different regions around the world, including in our own region in Southern Asia, and every time you have this notion of like, uh, you know, what kind of a broker U.S. stands to be, you know, uh, is it an honest broker, impartial broker, partial broker? Mm -hmm. If you already have an image about U.S.-Israel relationship as being too close knitted, what kind of a broker does that make the United States in the region? Uh, and that, that's something that I really want to know so that, uh, uh, you know, even the students can benefit from understanding these nuances. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you, Dr. Komar. Uh, Kamar, please, I will if you, uh, pick up whatever you left out, sir. Well, I think uh, perhaps I would actually be able to, uh, you know, give a better idea. But uh, as far as the, uh, and I'm not an expert on US foreign policy, uh, so as far as the U.S. Uh, relations with Israel is concerned, it is indeed a special relation, relationship. Uh, Israel is the, uh, if you look at the region, Israel is the most important. Perhaps one can actually say that in the entire world also, that Israel is the most important strategic ally of the United States. Uh, third point is that there is, uh, with the specific question which you are asking about the uh, a bipartisan issue. It is a bipartisan issue in uh, in the United States, in the Washington, in, in the White House, in the in Washington. Uh, but the changes in the White House can have certain, you know, uh, implication for Israel or for the Middle East, for the larger region. And I think, uh, depending on uh, who is, you know, who is in office. Uh, there can be certain, you know, uh, variation. For example, if we go back a little, you know, during Barack Obama administration, the relations between Israel and U.S. were not really, you know, as smooth as or as, you know, kind of good as we can see right now. And as Sir during his presentation was saying that, you know, perhaps sometimes the President Trump is actually more pro-Israel than Netanyahu himself. So, you know, I, one can actually see that there is a very special kind of a, uh, a situation which uh, the US was in right now. But uh, I think it is certainly a bipartisan, bipartisan issue, no doubt about it. Um, if I can compliment what you said that uh, uh, Manish was probably referring to uh, Netanyahu not uh, saying anything about Biden, which is rather unusual. Because if you look at it, bipartisan basically would presupposes you say nice things about both the candidates. Even if you support tacitly one side, you don't explicitly do anything. But what Netanyahu has done it, he has simply put all the eggs in Trump's basket. He didn't meet anybody, probably because of Kushner. But if you look at yesterday evening, when Trump was calling him, and say that, you no, know, do you think that the sleepy Joe would have done Sudan? Netanyahu said, you know, whoever is supporting me, I'll support you. You've done a great job. Thank you very much. He didn't take uh, Trump, you're the only guy. Because he recognizes. Because that's, you know, the, the ship. And the US has the ability. For instance, if you read the Biden's uh, advisor, they are saying 
there was a specific question will israel be afraid of should biden comes to power and the reason this answer was brilliant they said biden knows israel personally since golda meir okay that is what it is they said it very brilliantly okay which means netanyahu may not know that many i know i go back to 47 years i know so therefore israel will position itself in that and the larger question yes israel is a domestic issue but israel is also much more than a domestic issue merely reducing it to a domestic issue would not uh, serve justice to that if you look at it on a whole range of issues there are convergence of interest there is an interest convergence between israel and the united states which you can measure in terms of voting in the un general assembly you can pick up any number of things and whenever there is a us makes a foreign policy initiative the first country to support is the united states so you, when you are looking for an ally it is not that you know issue based support no it is basically you are my friend whatever you do i support i think in that kind of dependability that is important and that is both works both ways israel is able to depend on the united states us is also able to depend on the uh, israeli leadership i think that is what it is and the final question of peace deals we can go into the details but if you look at the agreements from 1948 you do not have a simple peace agreement without active american involvement not one but that doesn't mean every time us is involved you are successful no but all the successful agreement had a very enormous american component thanks once again manish for taking your time thank you sir yeah nadi mahmed uh yes uh, thank you uh, i'll try to make my question as brief as possible uh dr mudassir komar touched upon this topic uh, about how the editorials especially uh, the saudi arabia emirati newspaper editorials sharq al awsat khalid times arab news what all these editorials have had uh, the recent articles have been reflecting a different dimension and have been calling for a peace with israel directly or indirectly I mean that's a but although that's a very recent trend. I mean uh, I remember be, before 2010, uh, I, I've I've never encountered such articles or such pieces. And all these countries have a large Palestinian diaspora. And when you know I grew up among some of these Palestinian kids, and whenever I have engaged with them, they it's a very sensitive matter for them. And I figured out that you know it's sensitive because also it's, it's sensitive because of the religious angle or the religious dimension that is attached to it. now you see some of the sloganeerings that are in palestine right, right now yes qatal atfaq al ar mean they call it the deal of shame and palestine mashal al bi palestine is not for sale so in such an environment and uh, the the religious communication the religious seminaries the religious organizations they have a very large role to play i think i mean uh, i do not have a particular position in here but i uh, what what i have gathered is that you know uh, a lot of these mosques a lot of this majlis they have had special prayer sessions whenever something bad happens in palestine that used to be the case right now uh, after after juma prayers the sermons the, the the tone and tenor of the sermons have changed and this is uh, the reality that we are encountering so how much of a focus how much of an attention should uh, each of these countries uh, play like you know uh, give to uh, the religious organizations and to promote a religious dialogue because no matter what The Palestinian question is uh, is a prominent issue in the Islamic world. So if not, if as you mentioned rightly, if if the Gulf powers back out of the Gulf powers warm up to Israel, the void will be filled with some other funding uh, from Turkey or probably from Iran. So uh, how, how do how can we have a grassroots level kind of a reconciliation in this uh, circumstance? Thank you. Mike is off. Uh, thank you nadeem i think you have asked a, a very uh, important question and as far as the later part of your question is concerned i think it is uh, you know the islamic world has been grappling with this issue uh, for the last 70 years and they have not really been able to come out with any uh, you know consensus 
as to how to deal with this situation. And I think uh, what we are seeing is a very uh, uh, kind of very clear divide now as far as not, not just the region is concerned, but the entire you know, Islamic world is concerned. And if you, for example, you very, very rightly pointed out that when you talk to the people on the ground, you know, students, seminaries and everything, they, it's a very sensitive issue. Even, even for example, if you talk to uh, people in India, they kind of associate the issue of Jerusalem as a very sensitive Islamic issue. All these things are recognized. I mean, I'm not saying that these things are not important. The problem is that you are not able to come out with a consensus response. The problem is that you are not able to uh, understand the, uh, you know, the finer nuances of it. The third issue is the, I mean, we, we were talking about interfaith dialogue in the Saudi context. You know, you also pointed out the fact that there has been some effort. The, you know, a very important question is, do you, do you recognize the rights of other communities and their, you know, claim as Jer Jerusalem being the, uh, uh, you know, religiously important for them also. For Jews, Jerusalem is central. Do you recognize that? Are you ready to give that right to the Jews or to Christians or anybody else? So I think that is something which is very important and it is not a question just for the states to, uh, you know, counter, but also the larger Islamic community that needs to understand or, you know, uh, 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 you know, come confront itself, reflect on these issues. I think that is something important. On the first uh, part of your question about the, you know, about the uh, media reports and media columns, actually it's not recent. Even in 2016, one of the former Saudi uh, 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 military officer, Anwar Eshki, he visited with a delegation to Israel. And uh, they talked about, and, the, and you know, the context was the Arab Peace, Peace Initiative and to promote the Arab Peace Initiative. But he took a delegation. This was the first time when a delegation actually went to Israel. And, and I recall one of the, uh, you know, in 2014, I was doing my field work for PhD in Saudi Arabia. And I did, I talked to some of the, uh, you know, people about, and I know that the Palestinian diaspora is there. But if you if you go back and if you look at Bandar's interview, you know, he was, he said about the, you know, problems. For example, the Palestinian support to Saddam Hussein in 1991. So they, they recall all those things with, a, with some degree of pain in the sense that despite doing everything to the Palestinian, they have not really been so reciprocative towards recognizing the Gulf countries interest and their own security dilemmas. So I think that is something which which needs to be recognized. Uh, even 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 in 2009, there were you know efforts by Obama administration to try and kind of bridge some of the issues. We know that Qatar and UAE, uh, Qatar and Oman had uh, you know uh, had trade offices, Israel trade offices after 1903, which continued almost mid. 2005, 2006 onwards. So I think all these things, you know, come bring. If if we bring all these two things together, what is happening right now makes more sense. Thank you. Okay, um, Krupa. Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes. Sir. So, so I have three questions and uh, my first question uh, is relating to uh, the presidential election, which is uh, coming up in US. So I was thinking uh, President Trump had a vision for peace plan in uh, uh, regarding Israel and Palestine. So I was thinking what will be the Joe Biden version of it and how will it impact the regional politics in a big way? And so my second question uh, is related, um, like uh, we know that amidst this uh, normalizing relation of Israel with Arab countries, 
Uh, we also know that uh, Palestine now could only depend on Iran and Turkey. Uh, so I was thinking, how far can Palestine depend on countries like Iran and Turkey? And on what grounds can they be helpful uh, for Palestinians? And so my third question uh, is relating to um, Israel's normalization. We, we have seen that Israel have uh, normal relations with Jordan. But uh, there are also other disputes uh, like uh, river water dispute between the two and uh, so on. So I was thinking uh, when Israel is saying that or Israel is having normal relations with other countries uh, in the Arab world. So how far it will be <coughs> and uh, how far it will help Israel uh, to, you know, in counter terrorism measures against the Islamic terrorisms and all. So, yes, sir. OK, I will pick up the first and the third question and uh, I leave the second one to Mudassar friend. Um, if you look at uh, Trump has put up a proposal after all these uh, months of behind the scene negotiations. And uh, Joe Biden, you know, he has not uh, announced anything. But, you know, if you look at it, they said certain things, you know, when it comes to annexation and others, Joe Biden has expressed his reservations over that. And they said, and so they actually, some of his advisors have said, we can even reverse it. So therefore, that is a very, uh, uh, you know, a great warning to Israel in that sense. And uh, if you look at it, Biden will build on the tactical gains in terms of normalization. But Biden will not go along if Israel is going to adopt certain portions of the Trump's plan in terms of annexation. It won't go that far. Nothing to do with Biden, but the Democratic Party by itself. Democratic Party is, you know, if you look at it, the Conservative Party is very good for foreigners. You have only one address, you deal with them and matter ends. But if it's a Democratic Party, there are too many guys around and everybody will come their own agenda especially on issues like human rights, all minority rights, all of them, quite a lot of countries will be in trouble under a Biden administration. Because, you know, the, the, the support base of uh, the Democratic Party is much more diverse. And therefore, you know, the, the Republicans are much narrow. You are pro-American battery and you don't know whatever you want to do. I don't care about it. For instance, Biden will not accept uh, a settlement spree which Netanyahu wants to do. So that's going to be a thing to watch. And the, the third question is about Jordan. You know, you're, you are absolutely correct because that is going to be a real challenge for Jordan at two levels. One, the Palestinians are opposed to the normalization and the Palestinians make up a bunch of the Jordanian population. Therefore, Jordan's ability to get closer to Israel is greatly limited. At the same time, by Israel getting closer to Emirate, Jordan would be compelled to compete with the Emirates. Basically, if you don't do it, I'll get the Jordanian to Emirates to do it. So therefore, Jordan will be at a, an extreme dilemma. At one level, you will have the Arab pressure to move closer to Israel. At the same time, you will have a domestic pressure from the Palestinians not to get closer to Israel. And I think this is going to be a very, very difficult for Jordan. So you, Jordan may continue the security cooperation because security cooperation was going on from 1948. But a visible political or economic cooperation would be difficult. For instance, Jordan and Israel agreed last year for the supply of gas. And if you look at it, among all the options, that was the cheapest option available. But there was an enormous domestic opposition. So therefore, people are rather star than support Israel in that. So in the sense, you know, the, the rhetoric still is more important. Even if what you are doing is what you are calling for doesn't serve your interest. So therefore, Jordan will be an extremely difficult position. You'll have a Emirati pressure to get closer and the Palestinian pressure not to get closer. That is going to be a, a difficult one. I'll leave the second question to Mutasi. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Krupa, for that uh, question. I think uh, uh, 
and I, as I was mentioning during my presentation and Sir also during his presentation mentioned about the Turkish aspect, you know, and the Iranian aspect. Uh, the Iranian, in fact, both, both the support is uh, to the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian uh, leadership uh, is, is both strategic and tactical. And it is not, it is more to advance their own interest than actually advancing the Palestinian interest. For example, I mean, Turkey, as Sir was also mentioning, has its own relations with Israel. Turkey was the first Muslim country to recognize Israel, to, to establish diplomatic relations with Israel. They have very robust, had at least till 2008-9, very robust economic, diplomatic, you know, security relations. 2008-9 onwards, Mavi Marmara, things started to kind of derail a bit. It had a lot to do with the party currently in power, the president, his own ambitions. Uh, and and if you look at it from there on, things have you know kind of gone downhill. But even even two days back, there was a you know a meeting between Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce and a, a you know Ankara based you know economic organization about promoting trade. So they, when it comes to Turkey, they themselves are promoting trade with Israel. But when it comes to other countries, Gulf countries, they are very uh, you know, sharply reacting to that. If I'm a Palestinian, I will look at not who is blindly supporting me or who is, you know, just bringing some donation or some, you know, funds to kind of, you know, do things. I will look at how can I maximize my own interest? How can I achieve my own goal? And what is your goal? Your goal is to have a stake. That is the first thing. And if 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 Turkey is really honest and kind of sincere in achieving me my goal, I will perhaps take help from Turkey or whether Turkey can actually help me achieve that goal. So I think we need to, I mean, uh, you know, from the Palestinian point of view, one needs to be very careful uh, in terms of uh, being very reactive, one needs to take stock of a situation as again, Sir was saying that this is the time when you go back and reflect as to what went wrong. And this is the time when you can actually start afresh. The first step would be to perhaps build a consensus among yourself as to what is your goals and how you can achieve those goals and accordingly plan. Without that, I don't really see, uh, I mean, that Palestine, li like it has always, it has been since the last 70 years, would be a geopolitical issue. It was a priority issue. It is no longer a priority issue. Perhaps it will fade away and the Palestinian people will continue to suffer. So I think it's a very important time for Palestinians themselves to go back and reflect. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Purnima. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, with the recent red uh, post by the ISIS on uh, Saudi Arabia and its oil, indus uh, oil industry, uh, majorly referring to its support to the, its neighbor's normalization of relations with Israel, uh, how big is this threat posed by ISIS? And uh, will it uh, influence Saudi Arabia's decision on its normalization of relations with Israel? And that said, uh, a sub question, uh, what are the prospects and challenges for Saudi Arabia to normalize its relationship with Israel? I will answer the second part. Probably Mudasar will answer the first part of ISIS. If you look at this, the Bahraini relations with Israel would not have happened without the Saudi support. The tacit support in Saudi Arabia is a precondition. I would say the same thing about Emirati. Given the personal relation between the two leaders, Saudi Arabia had a role in the Emirati normalization. So having said that, Saudi Arabia is in, not in a hurry. Because two days ago, an Israeli uh, uh, writer has mentioned, Israel opened an office in Bahrain 11 years ago. Today, they are only changing the nameplate. So therefore, this is what it is. 
Israel is not interested in, in the symbolic uh, thing. They want substance. So even if Saudi Arabia did not move, I am not so sure nothing is happening between the two countries. They may not have a flag and an embassy and a CD car. And if you look at the same thing happening even with Iran, they never had an embassy in that sense. But whoever was appointed in Tehran a direct access to the king with no ambassador will have it. Probably American ambassador is only one who will have a direct access to the ruler. But Israeli diplomat has. So therefore Israel will not be worried about symbolism. So I'm sure that something substantial is there. But having said both this point, I would say that Saudi Arabia will not be in a hurry to do it. They would probably wait for Biden or what happens after the elections. Because they already they would be in serious trouble. Then uh, over Khashoggi, they would probably wait for that. And you know, Israelis are also not in a hurry. Time is on the side. They can wait for a while. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Purnima, and I think sir, sir, I will echo Sir's point uh, that actually when it comes to the informal relations, they are already there. Uh, it's it's and it's not a secret anymore. I mean, the informal relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia have been uh, there for some time. Uh, and and uh, the other point when it comes to, for example, the secret uh, the revelation regarding Bahrain. Uh, for example, the first meeting between Benjamin Netanyahu and Abdullah bin Zayed, the foreign minister of UAE, happened, took place in 2012. So, you know, I mean, things have been going on. Now, as far as the ISIS is concerned, it is a serious threat, certainly. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, uh, for other Gulf countries also, uh, ISIS is a threat for the whole region, for the world. Uh, so, uh, but the in the in the current geopolitical developments, current geopolitical situation, this becomes a very uh, sensitive issue, very uh, you know serious threat for Saudi Arabia. More so because Saudi Arabia houses the two holiest site, uh, Mecca and Medina. Uh, so uh, and and you know ISIS has in the past also said these kind of things that you need to. Uh, they have called the Saudi regime all kind of names. And said that you know you need to get uh, rid of the uh, House of Saud from the Arabian from the from Jazeera al Arab. So uh, this th this is a serious threat, and there have been uh, even though uh, Saudi Arabia has been able to uh, kind of with the counterterrorism measures and with help from the United States take action against sleeper cells and all that, but there have been uh, many a times almost every few. Uh, if not months, every few uh, couple of months, there would be one sleeper cell or the other of the jihadist uh, group, either uh, you know of ISIS or of uh, Al Qaeda, uh, coming to light, and you know action is taken against them. So, uh, as far as the Saudi security point of view, it is a very serious threat, and uh, uh, they take this threat also very seriously. Thank you, uh, Aditya Kumar Singh. Aditya. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one for uh, Dr. Mundisar and other one is for Professor Kumar Swami. <clears throat> now, my first question is to Dr. Mundisar. You, uh, sir, you talked about uh, uh, Palestine losing uh, the biggest uh, key they had that is the normalization relationship with the Arab world. So do you think they need to uh, uh, give a retrospect uh, to their attitude towards the Arab world? And uh, they have been constantly abusing the uh, Gulf uh, leaders and others for normalization. So do you think they can do a uh, rethinking about their attitude and uh, think that the normalization pro process could give them a better leverage in uh, resolving their issue uh, uh, with the Israelis as uh, the Arab world or the Gulf countries would have uh, more leverage to pull the strings to have a better uh, relationship or to further their uh, interest, the Palestinian cause. And my second question is uh, to Professor Swami. Uh, so yeah, 
uh, I'll just take up the point uh, which one of the earlier speaker mentioned about uh, the gap uh, being cre created uh, due to the normalization of the relationship, and that would be most probably filled in with uh, in, uh, by Turkey or Iran. So I have three parts to this question, uh, sir. How do you see, uh, sir? Do you see any uh, uh, resentment uh, in the Arab world, or do you see uh, the sympathy uh, for the uh, Palestinian cause getting a uh, backbench in the Arab world due to this? Uh, and uh, second part is, uh, how do you uh, imagine the new uh, geopolitics rivalry uh, uh, being created due to this? Uh, intervention of the Iranian or maybe the, for that matter Turkey and uh, how do you see the Israel playing a role in that tribal group? Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I think one of the points which uh, which uh, which I kind of trying well, I was trying to make during the presentation and I think sir also uh, kind of reflected on that a bit is that for the Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, for the Palestinian uh, leadership, uh, it is right. The, the normalization is a major blow. Major blow in the sense that you had countries that were supporting you vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Now they are no longer kind of, even though they, they, they are saying that we will support you, we still support you. They have made a subtle shift, not at the cost of their own interest vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And I think that is something which is very important for the Palestinian leadership to understand that if at this point they do not understand that countries that earlier supported them even at the cost of their own interest are no longer ready to compromise their own interest to give a blank check to Palestinians. How should they approach their own, you know, uh, uh, their own, uh, you know, uh, movement or whatever you call for their, you know, uh, achieving the statehood. And I think that is something very important. Uh, they certainly have lost a leverage. It has made the the Arab peace initiative, which which preconditioned Israeli resolution of Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, to normalization between Arab and Israel, more or less now that Arab peace initiative is dead. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I would be uh, kind of say, uh, putting myself from the Palestinian perspective, I think this is a very uh, big moment of truth, as, as one can say, uh, for the Palestinian leadership, and it is high time that you know uh, uh, the the Palestinian leadership comes together and reflects on their attitude and behavior and you know look forward in a more positive manner than continuing with the negative attitude okay, okay. thank you um Arushi? Second question one second oh the, uh, no, sir, go ahead. the second question sorry my friend um on the question of uh, Turkey and Iran you know if you are uh, from a Palestinian point of view you have to accept whoever is ready to support you at this point of time. There is an old saying, beggars can't be choosers. You were in such a situation, you look at the whole region, they are the only countries which are willing to support you. But at the same time, you need to look at, you know, sometime there is an expression in English called kiss of death. Kiss is normally associated with romance. There could also be kiss of death. Which basically means if you are seen with somebody, that's the end of your history. You're, you're finished. So therefore, Palestinians will actually be wondering, should I get support from, from Iran? Hamas is a different story. The legitimate Palestinian authority taking the support from Iran, your legitimacy becomes questionable. So therefore, when you are taking the support, you should also look at the credentials of the supporter. <laughs> So that is going to be an interesting thing. But you know, one thing we we tend to forget, there will be a, a change of leadership even in Palestine. Abu Abbas is 80 plus. So therefore, the kind of leadership which is going to come to Palestinian uh, movement will also have a bearing. 
So therefore, they would be able to do it. So what I'm looking at is if Trump comes to power, the power trajectory is more or less the same. But if Trump is not going to come, if Biden comes to power, if the Democrats are able to capture the uh, House and the Senate, you will have a very, very interesting combination. Because that is where probably I would say, rather than uh, criticizing the Trump and everything he did, the Palestinians should reinvent themselves. Okay, so to align themselves in such a way that you could change without offending anybody. If the Palestinians think that, you know, okay, uh, Biden going to undo everything Trump did, then they are in for a trouble. But Trump might give them an opportunity to get out of the mess you have created yourself. That would be, I would probably look at the uh, impending change in the Palestinian leadership and the liability and assets of taking support from Turkey and Iran. From an Israeli point of view, Turkey was important because Turkey was one of the very few Islamic countries ready to talk to Israel. Today, I have more countries at my disposal. Therefore, Turkey also no longer has a leverage. It had a leverage. But now, yeah, you're one more country. But today, you know, in financial terms, the Emirate is much resourceful than Turkey and the Emirate. So therefore, Turkey also lost its leverage. At the same time, while supporting the Palestinians, Turkey is not ready to end its diplomatic relations with Israel. You also recognize it comes with a cost. Okay, um, Arushi. Arushi. Uh, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for really valuable insights. I learned a lot. And so, so uh, my question is: it it pertains to the seventh paragraph of the agreement. So uh, this paragraph reads the party stand ready to join with the US to develop and launch a strategic strategic agenda for the Middle East in order to expand regional diplomatic trade stability and other cooperation. So uh, some uh, experts are of the opinion that this can be seen as a view uh, as a, um, as a handout and a pretext for wider security cooperation, even a regional security architecture. Yet uh, the uh, treaty does not call for a mutual defense alliance, so it cannot be reasonably interpreted as pointed uh, point uh, as being specifically pointed towards Iran. In fact, some uh, Emirati officials wanted to avoid any such uh, impressions entirely. Even so, some observers may argue that paragraph 7 will unite those governments in the region who are uncomfortable with political Islam, perhaps encouraging them to form an axis against states who ardently favor it. For example, like Iran, Turkey and Qatar. So, sir, uh, my question is, is uh, a regional security architecture part of the consideration and can it be a feasible future outcome of the accord? Thank you, sir. Okay, if, if, I, if I take the liberty of answering this question, uh, since the end of the Cold War, people are talking about a regional security architecture. There were even efforts to say, can we replicate ASEAN model to the Gulf? And some of the Gulf countries also tried 6 plus 2 with Egypt and Syria. And the, if you look at the thing, Iran is a threat which, you know, a large number of countries agree in the Gulf. But if you look more closely, Iran is not a primary threat. Most of the countries are threatened domestically. And therefore, how you are going to your regional security architecture is going to help you. So therefore, it is not, you know, you, if you are looking for an alliance and everything, you have to alliance against whom? And the moment you say Iran, you are going to simply make yourself more vulnerable. So United States can say Iran as an evil. Emirate cannot because Emirate is a neighbor. It is like saying Australia can declare China as an enemy state. You and I cannot. China is my neighbor. So you have to, the geography plays an important role. How do you articulate your position? You may be afraid. 
See, Nepal is afraid being sandwiched between India and China, but they will never say it openly. So therefore, you need to recognize that is why it is not explicitly you don't mention it. Emirate definitely cannot mention. Israel can, Emirate can. At the same time, the, the wording is such that it gives you broad enough understanding you can do whatever you want to do. And that is what it is. Any agreement had to be vague enough so that it is it is possible to expand. At the same time, it doesn't tie you down. If you are looking that, you know, that paragraph is going to be a, a Gulf version of NATO. No. That's not going to happen because NATO presupposes American willingness to play a leading role. US is not ready with or without Trump. US is more interested in Indo-Pacific, not in the Gulf. So they would rather have a similar arrangement in Indo-Pacific, not in the Gulf region. So therefore, it is vague enough. Israel would like to put us in Iran, but at the same time, not beyond a point. They wouldn't do that because the moment you put Iran, it becomes an anti-Iranian forum and it won't take off. So you, it is vague enough. At the same time, you include the, uh, the security component. That is where diplomacy comes up. You actually express your more interest without being so much explicit about it. You only show your interest, not beyond that. Okay, uh, Rahul. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you all for the comprehensive lectures and um, they were of really great help. So my question is uh, for Sir Kumar Swami and uh, so you did answer my question already in part when you were replying to Arushi, but still I would like to ask that uh, when we say that UAE and Israel signed a peace deal, so I, I want to ask that um, when we talk about the word peace in a peace deal, uh, was there ever an active conflict? So in lack of an active conflict, how can we call that a peace deal? And if we were to say that relations have been normalized, there might be uh, a two front scenario where states might have a mutual benefit or states might have a mutual fear against each other, which they might be trying to delay it by at least a couple of years uh, due to this agreement. So uh, one of the benefits that if we were to argue that both of these states have the United States brokering a peace might give them time to build upon their own arms and capabilities before any new conflict emerges in the region. And we talk about a mutual fear that the states have for each other. Uh, I would like to know what uh, that would be because, uh, like you said, if you were to talk about a de facto alliance against Iran, um, the perspective that I have on de facto alliances is that the dynamics of those relations could change at any moment and they are very theta specific. For instance, India and US could talk about a de facto alliance against China, but when it comes to other deals such as uh, brokering peace for the Kashmir issue or for Afghanistan, these concepts of de facto alliances break at that point of time. So that's what I wanted to ask that uh, leaving aside the part of you know, creating uh, de facto alliance against Iran, what were the mutual fears that UAE and Israel have against each other that they went forward to normalize the relations with? You know, when you say you're right, there is no bilateral conflict between the two. For a number of years, the conflict was uh, framed within the Palestinian injustice and the absence of a statehood. But gradually you recognize that even though you are ready to continue with that support, you are, you are changing the tactics, number one. Number two, the conflict is not necessarily military conflict. For a number of years, an Israeli was not allowed to go to uh, Emirates. You cannot even travel. And if you look at the maps in the region, Israel doesn't even exist in the maps they produce. Suppose, for instance, if you are from uh, uh, Telangana, and if I put up a map in Andhra Pradesh, which included everything, how will you feel about that? You don't even exist in the map. And that is a kind of situation. So if you look at it, conflict was your refusal to come to terms with it. And gradually things were changed. So when you say I have a peace means, I'm not saying you become a great buddy. 
But I'm saying that you are willing to look at the other. I may have a difference. Your five finger is not same. They are different. So the difference was that previously what was happening was they were not ready to talk to each other because of the Palestinian question. But today they say, OK, I have a difference. Let's talk about other issues. That is the kind of things. This alliance, I'm not so sure India would be, let's not get into different issues, but Iran would be a one. But what I would say that it's not just about Iran alone. You know, all said and done with all the wealth, Emirate is a small country. And uh, Samina I put the figure that no, Emirate population and Israeli population is almost same. There is one big difference. In the Israeli case, the population of Israel is a population of the citizen population. If you look at Emirate, almost 88% of the population is a resident population. That is, they are expatriates. The citizens make only 12% of the population. So therefore, when you look at the security, Emirate is a small country. And a small country you and I may not understand because it's a huge. See, God forbid, if there is a crisis in India, let's say China, Pakistan, Russia, all of them gang up against India. We can shift the capital to Manipal campus and India will still be there. We may be very small, weak, but we can exist as a state. But if you look at in Israel, the shortest distance between the Mediterranean and the West Bank is 11 uh, miles, sorry, nine miles, seven, uh, 16 kilometers. 16 kilometers is the distance between my house and CR Park, not even the airport. It's shorter than that. So therefore, Israel is a small country. Emirate is a small country. So therefore, when they look at it, they were saying Iran is only one part of the story. And what they're trying to do is by expanding their economic and technological capabilities, they can actually improve the security things. Security doesn't mean military. It's basically a sense of confidence. Can I manage it? That is what is up. See, you can ask any question to your professor because he gave you that comfort level. That is what he would say. You are more confident. The same thing, if you probably come to me, you'll, you will be shivering. Oh, what kind of this guy? Yeah. So therefore, security is not just military. One is the ability to deal. I think that is what both the countries are focusing in on. Yes, but it's much more than Iran. You have to look at the smaller, what you would call the the security dilemma of small states. Thank you, sir. I think uh, we have one last question uh, by Ms. Purnima. Oh, God. Again, second question. I then you have to buy me a coffee. Otherwise, I'm not giving a second answer. I think she will. Okay. Go ahead, Purnima. Uh, picking up from your uh, argument that uh, Russia could be a better peace broker in uh, in the entire West Asian region, uh, does Russia really have the kind of resources to be a peace broker? And most importantly, does it have any intent, provided that it has its own stakes to secure in the Mediterranean and it has its own vested interests? Uh, so, how is it possible? How can Russia be considered a better peace over region than the United States? You know, um, I only understand Russia. Rest of the things were lost in the transit, but I could I could try to answer this question. Can Russia be a better uh, peace, uh, you know, broker than uh, China? If you look at it, if there is one country which is talking to all the parties in the region, that is Russia, Israel, and the Palestinians. Hamas and Fatah, Syria and Turkey, and uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, all these countries, even Egypt and Israel, all of them. I cannot think of, you know, United States doesn't do it, China doesn't do it, because not in the political sense. They only talk bilateral issues, they don't talk multilateral issues. Ch Russia has the only power which is capable of doing this, but Russia comes with a baggage. It doesn't have a roadmap. Okay, I talk to everybody. I don't know what to do with that. 
Okay, that's the kind of dilemma. I know everybody, but I know I'm not able to capitalize on this situation. And that is where US is still the dominant player. Even though US doesn't talk to a lot of people, whether it's a Hamas, whether it is the uh, um, Syria, all of them, but US still has a leverage primarily because it has a roadmap. It has the ability to do it. And Russia, even though it has a better equipped, it doesn't have the roadmap. And uh, with the permission of the chair, can I ask questions to you also? Nanda, sir? Sir, please I'm, go ahead. <laughs> OK, please in, go ahead. OK, guys, this is, you know, it's an exciting, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I would say the gathering which we are hot. But all I'm asking you is if you ever, as long as you're working on the Middle East, for me, Middle East from Morocco to Iran, any aspect, you can even work on cutlery in Middle East. I don't care. As long as you're working on Middle East, just, you know, always don't hesitate to trouble us. See our website, ask me questions. Maybe, you know, we will come again and again. We will have a conversation. As long as you keep Middle East as your focus from, from Morocco to Iran, any aspect, not necessarily politics. It can even be food and culture, music, dressing, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I'm extremely grateful to Nanda Kumar sir for uh, uh, bringing all of us together. It's, uh, it's really great. You know, this day is all the more important because on this day, 11 years ago, we started the Middle East Institute, exactly this date. This is the day we got the our formal papers accepted by the societies. Forum for Middle Eastern Studies, it was registered on this day. So for us, this is a foundation day. And okay. I don't know how Nanda Kumar picked it up. It is really grateful to you, sir. It's absolutely grateful. I'm, I'm delightful all the questions you're asking for everybody. And God willing, we'll see next time in person. I love to come to Manipur and all the whole, whole team we would like to bring, including Ambassador uh, Sanjay Singh, sir, and others. We will come to Manipur, Manipur for a direct face-to-face -face interaction, not just on the Google team. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we planned it and uh, it finally ended up on a 24th. It wasn't that uh, we wanted it to be this way. We wanted it to be a little earlier and it happened. So, and I think it happened for a reason. I think it's been eventful and uh, I think the way it picked up in the last session and uh, all of them waited for, I think, to listen uh, holistically and then ask questions, I think so. So I'm glad that most of them made use. I'm sure many of them would continue to have a lot of questions which they can uh, post to you and interact in the days to come and those of them interested in the subject i've always said them to get in touch with and or whichever uh, they find it convenient and this would certainly not be the last one, one it would be only the beginning one small thing you know me and mudasa could actually build on what uh, ambassador sanjay singh sir and sabina ma'am actually provided the information exactly. we won't exactly. be able to say anything we don't have to go exactly. back to the details so we, true, true, true. we are on the 14th floor, but they were the foundation for the talk today. Absolutely. I think that that's the way uh, seminars are. And I think for me, a success of a webinar or a seminar is also uh, uh, due to the number of questions that we have. So that's how we measure it. And from that perspective, it's been extremely enriching and we learned a lot. And we would continue to engage uh, in days to come in many more uh, different ways. And as you mentioned, we would be more than happy to host you at Manipal. We would certainly want to have all of you and have a one-to-one -one talk and we would engage in different way. And uh, I would also request my students to get in touch with all, uh, all of you at the MEI and then uh, make the best use of it. And um, so uh, formally at the end, I would want to thank uh, each one of you more so specifically Ambassador Singh for uh, having taken us uh, time in the busy schedule and being part uh, party to this and then accepting to deliver a lecture, an exceptional uh, lecture this morning. And then followed by Dr. Samina Hamid. I think that was brilliant in the sense the numbers and uh, many other things that the way she uh, put it across more so being students of geopolitics, our students are very keen to look at the maps. And I think uh, that went extremely well for us and then followed by Mudassar. We wanted that perspective in, in fact, um, uh, otherwise it would be lost in as if we are celebrating the um, the accord. So we wanted that uh, component too, and it was well balanced by him. 
and then followed by anyway that was an expected uh, uh, outcome <laughs> at the end and and as usual i think things went extremely great i'm i'm, I'm really grateful to my head of the department dr arvind kumar and then my colleagues who also equally engaged and special thanks to my colleague dr anand he helped mm. me in uh, setting up this whole event in terms of um, um, creating this uh, mode and everything so my special thanks to him and to my two research scholars um, uh, dr uh, sorry uh, mr nadeem and then ms purnima both of them took responsibility and they they are they have also agreed to make the report of uh, this particular seminar so they would make the transcript and keep it ready and then we would share and then we can probably uh, publish it in whichever possible manner so uh, thanks to all of you my special thanks to professor uh, kumar swami for uh, believing that we can do this together and then take this uh, relationship forward and to all of you uh, for being kind and all the participants for your patient listening and being party to this uh, for the last two and a half hours so kind of you and uh, have a great day ahead take care thanks namaste thanks well, thank you very much have a nice day and have a nice festival festive time ahead thank you Thank you very uh, thank much. You.